Uh, how many know that it's good to take the good word of God and just move us by His Spirit, and by the word of God, the Spirit of God, as God speaks to our hearts. I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the sixth chapter of the book of Romans. Sixth chapter of the book of Romans. I'm going to read to you the first 12 verses, and then I want to draw a text verse from the book of Job. And uh, if you want to find Job, it's before you get to the book of Psalms. And um, we'll be sharing out of that the 14th chapter, verse 13, as a text verse out of the book of Job. But first, let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 12. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And it begins with a question, what shall we say then? I guess we ought to back up and see why he asked the question. Well, he asked the question because it says in verse 20, but where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And so the Bible says where there's sin, there's going to be much more grace abounding. And, of course, he asked the question then, what shall we then, or what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? That so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And henceforth, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, before we go to the book of Job, chapter 14, verse 13, I want to point out in verse 4 it says, We are buried with Jesus by baptism into his death. And then I want to point out in verse 5, We have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We should be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now the phrase is made over and over again in this sixth chapter of the book of Romans that God's people have died. They have died in Christ, but yet they still live because of a greater power than death, the power of the resurrected Christ. Now I want to show you something very interesting. And if you would go with me to the book of Job, verse 14, or chapter uh, 14, rather, verse 13. And we'll go back to this in just a little bit. But, you know, as a young Christian, I used to read the sixth chapter of Romans, and it seemed like a mystery to me. And the more I've grown in the Lord, you know, I spit out my pacifier, I learned to walk, and, and I got to where I, you know, could eat and feed myself and take care of myself uh, as a newborn babe in Christ. And I grew up a little bit. Uh, this life of Jesus began to grow on me. And began to grow in me. And I began to discover the mystery of his suffering. The mystery of the death through Christ. And how he brought us up in the resurrection of Christ. Romans chapter 6 just makes a lot of wonderful good news sense to me. And I hope that it will to you before we get done tonight. I just wouldn't want anybody to be a part of Ozark Full Gospel Church. And not understand what it means to be dead in Jesus Christ. And to be alive in the resurrection of God. 
Job chapter 14, verse 13, this is our text. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave. Now, Job is speaking, and he's been very sick. And he says, thou wouldest hide me in the grave. That thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath pass by or be passed. Now, Job knew that a wrath was coming. Knew that God was going to judge. He knew that God was going to bring his judgment upon planet earth. And he said, thou would hide me. That thou would hide me in the grave and would keep me secret until thy wrath be passed. That thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. I want to use for a subject tonight and listen carefully because I really believe that this can set your feels on fire. This can really minister to your heart. The title of the message tonight is Resting in the Bloody Dead Body of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Resting in the Bloody Dead Body of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll make a statement, and I want you to listen carefully because the whole sermon really rests on this one statement. And here it is. We can rest or hide in the dead, the bloody dead body of Jesus Christ. We can put our past, our sinful past, the wickedness of our life, and we can put that in the bloody body of Christ. We can hide in the dead body of Jesus Christ, but we can live in the resurrected Christ who rose again from the grave. Always remember that. Something that needs to be dead, let it be dead. And that which needs to be alive, let it be alive. Isn't that simple? Everything in your life that you want dead is already been crucified in Jesus for the believer. And everything that you would like to have alive is already provided in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, hear me. Saints of God, if you, I, 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 you're about half backslid now or you'd be shouting over this. Woo, praise God. Now, I, I, I want you to listen carefully because it's real important that you understand that in this last day, in the time in which we live, there has never been a time like now. Do you realize that right now in the world, there is earthquakes in divers places? There is war and rumors of war. The love of many has waxed cold. People are killing people in the name of God. There is civil war, civil unrest, war. There is famine. There is storms, there is pestilence, there is tsunamis as a result of great earthquakes in the oceans and in seas. There is volcanic eruption, there is murder, there is bloodshed, there is all kinds of storms brewing across the atmosphere even now as we speak. This world has become a constant um, turmoil of natural disasters. Now, I want you to listen carefully because it's real, real, real important that you understand that there is coming a storm that's so big. And when I say storm, I'm talking about the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Now, God didn't do that in Joplin. God didn't do that in Florida. God didn't kill all them people in Tsunami and Japan. God's not out here killing people, but God will judge the planet. And the prophets of the Old Testament said there's coming a storm in the land. And this storm will be so horrific that no one will be able to hide from this judgment of God. And Job, I think, was tapping into that when he said, Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave. The only safe place is to already be dead. Now listen. The storm in Joplin was so horrific that I am told that in that storm it had winds of over 215 miles per hour. That's hurricane and higher 
winds. I am told that in its vortex there was more than one tornado. And the winds were so powerful, the twisting, the turning, it was twisting steel beams in pieces. It hit a building and literally disintegrate. It hit St. John's Hospital, five floors exploded, just literally within, just the windows exploded out. And I think there was two or three killed, maybe five in that process. They were not safe in a building that was made of steel. I'm told that some scurried and ran to the Home Depot and some hid where the concrete walls were. Because in Home Depot, they keep material that's very heavy for the roof or shingles and, and for uh, paneling and sheetrock. And it takes huge walls to hold these things up. And I'm told that walls two to three feet thick, people were hiding against the wall thinking, I'm safe here. And the storm blew those concrete slabs that reached from the ground to the top like Slamming them like pancakes against the concrete and beneath it crushing flesh and bones. There was no place to hide. I heard where one person was in a car and the sunroof burst open and it sucked the man out of his car. You heard the story that of the person in the pizza hut that scurried people into a walk-in cooler. And when he went to try to shut the door, he couldn't get it to latch. So he went and got a bungee cord or some kind of rope and he began to wrap it around the door and wrap it around his own wrist to hold that door shut. And when the wind came through, it literally blew the building away and sucked that man out into his death. But yet those that were put in the little cooler survived some way, somehow. Miraculously, some survived. I said all this to say this, there is storm so big that there is no safe place to be. The warning has been made. And, and I know God's not the author of what happened there. God's the author of building it bigger and better, comforting and blessing people. But you know, there's coming a time when God will come to earth and there will be a great storm. This storm will be so horrific that it will pale insignificant the economic storm that we're facing. The storms of literal winds and tornadic storms that blow through in the hurricanes. This storm will be so horrific that not one person will escape the judgment of God. Job said, the only safe place to be is in the grave. And he said, keep me in secret until thy wrath passes by. You see, the only safe place for a human being when it comes time for judgment day, and there is a great day coming. There's a judgment day coming. And I want, you to, tell, I want to tell you right now, there's a storm coming. And only Jesus Christ is the shelter that will keep us from harm. Only Jesus Christ will keep us out of hell. Only Jesus Christ will keep us from going to a, a, a devil's punishment, a devil's hell. Only Jesus Christ will rescue us. And, uh, and, and let me tell you something. He's not going to rescue us. He already has through the death of the Son of God and the resurrection of the Son of God. Jesus is not just going to uh, rescue us. Jesus Christ has already prepared short shelter from the coming judgment of God and Job says hide me in the grave let me say this hide in the bloody dead body of Jesus Christ put your past in the bloody body of Jesus Christ and live in the resurrection of the son of God see anything that deserves to die had already been taken care of on the cross of Calvary and it has been put to death. Anything that God wants you to have, such as abundant life, joy unspeakable, the glory of God in your life, it has been provided in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I have to say today, 
I'm safe. You can't kill a dead man. I'm already dead. The, the safest place in a storm, and you ain't gonna like what I'm about to say, but the safest place in a storm is the graveyard. Not one person, not one ambulance went there. The fire trucks didn't go there. The paramedics didn't go there. Why? Because there was nobody in the graveyard in danger. You can't kill someone that's already dead. And let me tell you something. As a child of God, I stand in the protection of God. And I'm not afraid of the wrath that's coming. Because I am sheltered in the dead body of Jesus Christ. I put my sin in the dead body of Jesus Christ. And let me say this. Number one, you can't judge or condemn a man that is already dead and buried. Amen? If a man is going to be trial, tried in a, in a court of law in this land today, and that man dies before his arraignment, dies before his judgment, they'll not go dig him out of the grave and bring him into the courtroom. It's done. Hello? You can't judge and condemn a man who's already dead. And I want to say, friends, tonight, I am already crucified in Christ and I'm already dead and my past has been dead, put to death and buried and I was baptized. Listen, the Bible says in, in verse uh, uh, in, in chapter 6, verse 4, that I was buried with him in baptism unto death. When I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God baptized me into the dead body of Jesus Christ. When I called out to God, repented of my sin, said, oh God, I'm so sorry. God took my past. God took my sin. God took my hell. God took my punishment. God took my judgment. God took my condemnation. And God put it in the dead dead body of Jesus Christ that bloody dead body of Jesus Christ and God buried it Amen. buried me praise God the Bible says we have been buried into his death by the spirit of God we've been buried into his death the Bible says we've been buried 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 to never get up again, the past is gone forever. But we have been planted in the likeness of his death, meaning we are raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Planted. My past was buried and never will come up. But my future is planted and I'm a growing and I'm a coming up. And the resurrection power of God is mine. If we've been planted together in this likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection get up, praise God. <laughs> Pardon me while I, whoo, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. My past is gone. Yeah. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Therefore there is, there is therefore now no condemnation that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit of God. Now listen to this. Romans chapter 8, verse 33 and 34 says, Who shall, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? You can't judge and condemn a dead a man that is already dead and buried. And I want to tell you, friends, James Akins is already dead and buried. My past has been buried. My sin has been buried. The old James Akins is gone, gone, gone. But God gave me a new breath from heaven. God gave me a new life from above through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now it's I who yields my soul to God and I reckon myself dead, alive unto Christ, dead into sin and sin no longer reigns in this mortal body I've been set free yeah. see you can't condemn oh yeah there's people that try to condemn my past 
But how many know that's just gossip? That's just words. Amen? I mean, you can say anything you want to say about me, but Jesus Christ took care of my past. You can, you, people can gossip. They can talk. Who can judge and condemn a man that is already dead and buried? Some may try to do it, but I mean, no, what people say don't change the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sin and rose again from the grave. What are you doing? Hey, hello, we're in church. Hello, I just said something that was remarkable. Not because I said it, but because God's word is remarkable. Amen? How many ever tried to bring up your past? How many ever tried to come along and others try to bring up your past? Maybe I ought to rephrase that. How many ever tried to bring up your past yourself? Yeah, we're kind of stupid sometimes. Amen? The dumbest thing you'll ever do is live in the past. The, the brightest thing you'll ever do is live in the future of the glory of God. Amen. I said amen. I said amen. I mean, know that it's good to be buried with Jesus Christ. Buried in his death. Raised in his likeness by the power of God. There is therefore no kind of, you can't judge me. People can criticize me. But does it matter? It's God that justifies it doesn't make no difference what anybody says as long as God says that I'm loved and saved and forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Oh, to make you real happy, praise God. Amen. 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 And by the way, when folks talk bad about me, it don't bother me. I mean, go down to the graveyard and talk about people that's dead. They're not going to get up and, and say anything. They're just going to lay there. Kick a dead man and he won't move. Spit in a dead man's face and he won't even wipe the spittle away. Why? Because he's dead. Nothing phases him. Let me tell you something. God's people need to be so in tune with the Spirit of God that the devil can't phase us. That the past can't phase us. That the things of the world can't phase us. Listen, when you're dead and buried, listen to me, when you're dead, pneumonia can't kill you. When you're dead, sickness can't destroy you. When you're dead, a bullet can't penetrate and kill you. When you're dead, a, a, a tornadic a storm cannot ravish your life. When you're dead, the, the heat of a, of a nuclear blast cannot destroy you. Why? Because you're dead. You can't kill something that's already killed. You can't stop something that's already been stopped. And I want to say, praise God, I got in the second Adam and the second Adam the last Adam Jesus Christ died with me inside of him and today I stand in glorious praise to God I've been crucified with Christ but now I live you think about that think about it if you're dead then you shouldn't let anything bother you Amen. So, preacher, I got a ways to go. Huh? How many feel like sometimes you've been hit with a steamroller at times? I heard about the guy that got ran over by a great big old steamroller. Got put in the hospital. They asked him where he was at, what floor he was on. He said, Well, I'm on the seventh floor. And so, what room he in? He said, I'm in room 29 through 20, 45. I mean, know you feel like you're in that. Vast place. You know, croaking's not always bad. You say, what's croaking? Dying. It's not always bad. As long as you die in Jesus, amen. I love the story about the little little boy who kept telling grandma, Grandma, would you would you croak? Would you croak like a frog? Would you would you croak? He just kept asking grandma, would you croak like a frog? Finally she croaked like a frog. He just smiled real big. Grandma said, son, why did you want your grandma to croak like a frog? He said, because grandma, my dad and mom said, when you croak, we're going to get to go to Disneyland. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> April, you either sit up taller or, or, or get a little better attitude back there, would you? 
I appreciate Terry and April. I appreciate everybody that comes out. Amen. The only reason you came out tonight, you thought maybe Dan was preaching. But I, I slipped one on you. Every now and then, I just don't tell nobody, and I just get up and preach. And, because, you know, I kind of like to blow a fuse every now and then. Amen. You can't judge or condemn a man that is already dead and buried. My past is already buried, already dead. The only state place in Joplin, Missouri, when that storm came through that was so big, it was a, what, a EF-5? The only safe place was underground. The only safe place was being dead. And I mean, no, the only safe place for God, for people on this planet Earth, when God comes, is to be dead in Jesus. It's already been done. Amen. Praise God. I, I'm so glad that I can tell you that I have been blessed with the death of Jesus Christ. And I'm putting my trust in the dead body of Jesus Christ. Hey, my future's in the dead body of Jesus Christ. I put my past in the dead body of Jesus Christ. I put my failures in the dead body of Jesus Christ. I put my sin in the dead body of Jesus Christ. I put my faults and my failures in life in the dead body of Jesus Christ. I put my, my own abilities and my own skills in the dead body of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I know that it's not by me, it's not by power nor by might, but by God's Spirit, saith the Lord. And I know I can put my trust in the living Christ. Amen. Amen. You say, what are you doing, preacher? I'm hiding in the dead body of Jesus Christ. But I'm living in the resurrected Son of God. Amen. Amen. Just that one phrase was worth your trip here tonight. Just that one thought. I'm hiding in the dead body of Jesus Christ, but I'm living in the resurrection of the Son of God. Number two, you can't torture or kill a man that's already dead. Now, I mention that simply to say this. The Bible says in verse 19 of Galatians, For I, through the law, am dead to the law. Meaning the law sentenced me, condemned me to death, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law or came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Let me tell you something. God's people are never put on trial anymore except for our faith. I'll never be tried for my sin of the past. But I'll certainly be tested and tried for my faith of today. And that's why I live under Christ. My faith is tested. Problems come. My faith is tested. But you can't torture and kill a man that's already dead. Does that mean God's people don't get sick? No, no, not at all. Does that mean that uh, God's men and prophets and women of God many times were tortured? Yes, they were. But there's a difference between being tortured by, by the world because of Jesus Christ and suffering. Let me tell you something. I've read the Fox Book of Martyrs and those people that burned at the stake and were sawn asunder by blades inside of uh, empty logs and those that were spent upon and they were skinned alive and their tongues cut out and their eyes uh, uh, pierced or burned out by hot pokers. None of those testimonies in Fox Book of Martyrs said that they, they uh, uh, suffered in a way that we think is suffering. It says they gloried in the cross of Calvary. It says they rejoiced in the power of God. Why? Because they were accounted worthy to take the suffering of Christ upon them, knowing that the afflictions of this life, the sufferings of this life only are for a moment, but the glory of God, it's light afflictions these sufferings are, but the glory of God will bust forth in our lives. And let me say, friends, today, a person may suffer sickness, they may suffer some problems, but let me say this quickly. Let the world spit in our face. It won't face us because there's a God bigger behind our face living inside of us looking through our eyes Hallelujah. 
Amen. Praise God. You can't torture and kill a man who is already dead. What does that mean? That means a child of God, the sting of death's been removed. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? A child of God that is full of the word of God and full of the Holy Ghost is not afraid to die. Why? Because they've already been there. They've already been through repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not excited about the ordeal of dying physically, but I'm not afraid to meet God because I know when I meet God, I'm going to meet God just like Job said. He's going to keep me in secret and I'm going to stand before God and when I get on the other side, He's not going to be judging me for my past because my past has already been punished in the body of Jesus Christ. Can't torture or kill a man that's already dead. You know, people think they're cute when they try to ridicule a child of God. They don't bother me. People ridicule me, and I just go off and shout and praising God, driving my little Mustang down the road, saying, "Glory to God! Glory to God!" I'm glad. I'm glad there nobody kick a dead dog. I'm glad that they kicked me. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, preacher, you don't feel good when someone rejects you. See, that's the problem. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. When I was in Galena, Missouri, handing out gospel tracts from door to door, and a man walked up to me, and I had my window down in the car, and he said, you blankety blank blank, and said several words, and, and spit in my face. Reached over and slapped me across the face. You know, the first thing I wanted to do was get out of the car. And I would have if he hadn't held the door shut. That's the grace of God, keeping me in the car. And I finally settled down. And I realized he didn't spit in my face, spit in the face of Jesus Christ. He was mad because I was out here telling people about Christ. It wasn't him, it was the devil in him, did it? And I rejoiced and praised God that I was accounted worthy for someone to and spit in my face. Did you feel bad about it at first? But when it, when it finally dawned on me, hey, I'm dead in Christ. He wasn't picking on me. He picking on Jesus. That's what Jesus Christ said to Saul of Tarsus, the great apostle Paul. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He didn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? He didn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? He said, Saul, why are you picking on me? Why are you persecuting me, Jesus Christ said. When you're picking on the church, you're picking on the Son of God. We're just an extension of the Son of God. Now, I don't always like it when someone says something to me and, and, and they hurt my feelings, but I always have to remember, dead people don't have feelings. My feelings are not supposed to be the feelings of that of the world. My feelings are supposed to be the feelings of joy unspeakable and full of glory from God. My nervous system isn't supposed to be alive. It's supposed to be alive in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How should I respond? I should respond like a son of God responds. Oh, hear me. Is anybody getting anything out of this tonight? Amen. Way too many Christians respond by how they feel. Well, it ain't how you feel it. You don't feel it. You faith it. I'm glad I feel it. I'm glad I praise God. But for every, whoo, glory to God, dancing a jig, there's someone going to come around and try to trip my dance up. Stop my laughter. How many know kids will drive you nuts? I like what Mark Twain said. He, I don't, they said he finally became a Christian, but he did say something I thought ought to have been in the Bible, but it's not. He said, when you've got kids, you take good care of them. He said, when they turn 13... You make sure that you put them in a box and just put a little hole on it. 
And said, then when they get through around 16, 17 year old, he says, you plug the hole. I mean, no, that ought to be in the Bible. I said, that ought to be in the Bible, but it wasn't. <laughs> well, maybe we can put that in the church covenant. I don't know. But anyway, but you can't, you know, listen, you got to learn that this thing isn't about how you feel and how you're faring. This thing is about how Jesus Christ is being honored in our life. Sure, we, we suffer. I don't, I, I don't think anybody in this room, and I know Dan at times suffers with what he's got uh, in his body. The devil tries to bug him and mess with him. But I doubt if too many people suffered any more than our sister Verlene with what she's went through. But how many know that these afflictions that we have are only for a moment compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us? Now, you know, friends... We, it, I, I guarantee you there was times when, when I was sick and there's times when you, you've been sick that you felt like a bullet to the head would have been better. Amen? And it's only by the grace of God you couldn't find the gun or the bullet. Amen? Amen. I had a guy walk into my office one time. He said, I'm going to commit suicide. I looked at him and shocked him. I mean, I shocked him. I said, how are you going to do it? He said, well, he said, I'm thinking about shooting myself in the head. I said, well, if you do, make sure you put it right under your chin and it'll go up through your face and just blow your whole brain out and it'll do a good job. He said, man, that might hurt. He said, I came here for comfort. I said, no, you came here for me to... For me to talk you out of doing what you're saying you're going to do. You came in because you want me to talk you out of committing suicide. And I just told you to do it right if you're going to do it. He said, some preacher you are. I said, are you going to do it? He said, no way. I said, then I achieved my goal. Amen. Amen. Folks need to, if folks would just wake up and realize, you know, a bullet through the head don't feel good. Well, I don't know that. I've never had one through the head, but... I'm sure I wouldn't live to tell it. But anyway, and I told the guy, the guy said, I'm going to commit suicide. And I said, well, why don't you just reckon yourself dead now and then let, let the rest of your life have, give it to Jesus Christ and then just consider you're dead, you're dead the rest of your life and then let Jesus have the rest of your life. I said, wouldn't that be a lot simpler? And it hurt a whole lot less. He said, well, I never thought about that. He said, does that mean I got to quit drinking? Does that mean I got to quit, you know, being unfaithful to my wife? I said, that means that the reason you want to kill yourself is because you are unfaithful. And you are drinking. He said, it's never been a God problem. It's always been a you problem. This thing has never been a God problem. It's always been a sin problem. Amen. Just like that one doctor told me. I went and seen him. He said, your blood pressure's up. I said, Doc, how high is it? And he told me it was really high. He said, I'm going to give you some really good medicine. He knew I was a preacher. He said, now when you get the way you don't need this medicine, he said, when you get right with God, come and see me and I'll take you off of it. I said, you call yourself a doctor? He says, and you call yourself a preacher? <laughs> he said, the reason you have hypertension, it's not because you're an old man, because you're not old. He said, the reason you have hypertension is he says, you're carrying your church around on your shoulders. He says, it belongs to God. Let him carry it. Let him build the church, and we can get you off this blood pressure medicine. <laughs> now, there are reasons people have blood pressure medicine, because their kidneys are having problems. There's reason... I mean, when you get up in years, your blood pressure climbs. I'm not saying that everybody has it because they're bad. But at my age, I had it, and it was because the doctor was right. I was stressed out. Amen. Well, I ain't coming back. Yeah, you will. 
<laughs> when you get right with God, you'll be back. Amen. But anyway, here's the last one. You can't even destroy a man that is already dead in Christ. You can't destroy a man that's already dead in Christ. And by the way, God's not going to destroy a man that's already dead in Christ. You see, the thing that God wants to do with the sinner, He did in Jesus Christ. And if a person don't get in Christ and be baptized into it, the, the dead body of Jesus Christ, the bloody dead body of Jesus Christ, then God's going to judge him because he's outside of Christ. But I'm in Christ, so I'm safe. I'm in Christ, so the devil can't stop me, can't destroy me. I'm in Christ. Death can't even destroy me. Sickness and disease Hatred of the world, atomic warfare. None of these things can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I'm safe. I'm protected. No storm can get me. Listen to me. God can't even get me because he would have to get his son Jesus. And I'm in his son Jesus. So God's not going to get his only begotten son to get me. He's going to say, glory to God, glory to God. I've got another son inside of that son. I've got two sons inside of that son. God looks down and says, hey, I've got Terry Wilkins inside of my son. Got Dan Snyder inside of my son. I've got the church of Ozark Full Gospel Church that's born again inside of my son. Hey, and I got my son inside of them. And they inside of my son is protection from the wrath of God and the things of the world. And the son of God inside of us is the overcoming life and the joy and the living for God. You see, when you got saved, you were baptized by the Spirit of God into the dead body of Jesus Christ and planted in the likeness of his resurrection. Now here's the thing. God puts you in Jesus for protection. From him. God put Jesus in you. To protect you. From you. Don't miss what I just said. You see. Christ didn't use the hope of glory. But you in Christ is to protect you from the wrath of God. You put in Jesus is where God puts you, the only place you're going to survive. But he puts Jesus inside of you so that you can reach out to others. You see, I've said this before, and I'm going to close with this. I know we're, it looks like the young folks class is already over, so they're getting double shot tonight. But... Um, I said this before. God spends a lifetime trying to get in us. And then when he finally gets in us, he spends the rest of our lifetime trying to get out of us to others. Isn't that awesome? See, God works hard to work it into us. And then once he works it into us, then we're supposed to work out salvation with fear and trembling. We're going to get it worked out of us into others' lives. Isn't that good? I said, isn't that good? Man, I tell you, I'm glad for the great truths of the Bible. I'm glad that nothing can destroy me, not even God, because God so loved the world that he made a place for I to go that when he does pass by, as, the, as Job said, hide me in the grave. Hide me in the grave. Job thought was thinking about the grave, you know, judgment and his dying physically. But what a biblical prophecy. Hide me in the grave of Jesus. Hide me in the grave of Jesus. And when the devil comes, he finds a tomb empty. Because you're hid in Jesus. Listen to me. And when God comes, he finds a people that's already been judged in his son Jesus. God can't judge you. 
He's already did it. It would be unjust for God to judge you a second time. He's judged you, found you guilty, and put you to death in the dead body of Jesus Christ. You have been put to death, sentenced to death in the body of Jesus Christ. And God will never bring that to you again because you've been liberated and resurrected in Jesus Christ. But when Jesus does return and he finds anyone not in Christ, they will be judged. And they will be sentenced to the lake of fire. Well, did anybody learn anything tonight? Anybody get anything that would stir your heart? You see, the purpose wasn't to, to ignite you, excite you. The purpose tonight was to give you something you could say, Wow, man, I, I'm really safe. I'm really blessed. God has got all the bases covered. God has taken care of us. Amen. I mean, we're going to make it, praise God. I'm telling you, April Wilkins is going to make it. There's a God in heaven. Amen. 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 The old April's in the graveyard, in the dead body of Jesus Christ. Let me make another statement. Please don't feel like I'm being sacrilegious. Religious. Don't, don't feel like I'm being irreverent. But the only part of the dead body of Jesus Christ that's still dead... Is my part, my sinful part, my life, my past. It's still dead in Christ. That's the only part of Jesus Christ that's still dead. Is the part, our part, that He took for us so that God could liberate us. Forever. We can walk in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Your sin was put away forever. Your sin was destroyed forever. Your past is gone. You're saved to the uttermost. Doesn't make any difference what you think about it. It's what God did. Let me say one more thing. Because I'm really getting close to sacrilegious. But when I got born again. Something happened inside of me. I was regenerated when I got born again. Something happened in my heart. But at the same time, something happened in the mind of God. God, too, was in some small sense born again. I don't mean he needed to be. I don't mean he was wrong. But he received a new quickening. Not that he needed it, but... His mind was transformed to us as being freed from sin, not guilty. When God did something in my heart called regeneration, something happened in God's mind called justification. And the devil says, go down there and kill that Ed Woodworth. And God says... Done dead. He's gone. Why? I see him over there. And God says, I don't. He's hid in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand with me. I hope you got something out of it tonight. I hope you received something blessed tonight. Terry sings that song that he wrote about no condemnation. That's an awesome song, Brother Terry. And I, you know, I thank God for the fact that God, God knew that the only way out of our predicament was we had to die. We had to. And the only way he had, to, the, only, the only thing that God could do was the miracle. He had to kill us in Jesus and resurrect us in life. And let us now live in the borrowed life of Jesus. Live in the life of Jesus. For the rest of our natural days on earth. Until we meet Jesus. Until we meet God. I mean my life ended when I was 23 years old. And I gave my heart to Jesus. My life ended. And the life of Jesus began in me. And now I enjoy 
the life of Jesus. That's why I'm supposed to reckon myself dead. And that's why we're not to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We're to reign over sin. We're conquerors. We shouldn't even consider sinning. You know why? Because for us to consider sinning, we've got to dig the old person up. Leave him buried. Amen. Leave him buried. I love it. I love it. How many got something out of this tonight? I mean, really. I mean, could say, boy, I, you know, I think I could just have a spell the rest of the week over this. Yeah, you better have more than that. You better have a life, the rest of your life over this. Because God did something incredible. He buried us in Jesus. But he planted us in the likeness of his death and in his resurrection. He buried our past, our sin. He raised our future, our life. He planted us. Amen. Judy has a garden planted. You know why? Because she's expecting something to come out of the ground. And God has us planted in Jesus. And he expects us to come up off of the earth and give praise to God. To give glory to God. Altar's open. I want to invite you to come. Maybe you'd like to just come and say, God, I want to thank you. Now, this is an odd prayer. But God, I want to thank you that I'm dead. I want to thank you that I'm dead. But yet I'm alive in Jesus. Would you do that? Come.